Hey everyone, and welcome to our live in conversation event with the lovely Tricia Stringer, who's coming to us from her home state of South Australia. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders, past, present, and emerging. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Can everyone ensure that they are muted while we chat to Tricia? There'll be an opportunity later on if you have a question for Tricia to raise your hand using the little icon at the bottom of the screen that says reactions, and then you can unmute yourself and ask your question. This is being recorded, so if you do not wish to do that, that's fine. Um, we do have a chat set, little part down there too. You can pop your questions in the chat and I'll relay them to Tricia at the end. Okay, first of all, Tricia is the non author of 14 novels set in Australia. She has written novels over multiple genres, Australian historical fiction, rural fiction, and women's fiction. Her new novel is Birds of a Feather, and there it is, which tells the story of what happens when three women are thrown together by unusual circumstances and then what happens after that. Welcome, Tricia, and thank you for chatting to us tonight. Thank you for having me, Janine, and uh, all the crew there. So I wish I was going to be there in person, but never mind. Thanks, yeah. everybody, for Zooming in. It was going to be an in-branch event, as we know, but it's great that we can still get together and talk about you and your book via Zoom. Before we chat about the book, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how what led you to become a full-time writer? So I live here in South Australia, as you mentioned, um, two hours north of Adelaide on York Peninsula. And uh, where I live, it's called the Copper Coast. And that's because we were a copper mining area many years ago. And um, I was teaching a four or five class when I experienced my first Cornish festival here. And it's a really big deal here. Everybody in all three towns gets involved. So it's Wallaroo, Kadena and Moonta. And we have lots of visitors. Um, when there's no COVID, we have overseas visitors. So it's, you know, a really big event. And I, there's lots of uh, information for adults and so on, but there wasn't a lot for younger children. I was teaching a year four or five class. So I thought, you know, if I could just come up with a bit of a story that might give them some background of this history. And so I thought, well, I'll just write a story. And that's when I realised that it wasn't quite that easy <laughs> to write um, a story and finish it. So I did a children's writing course and eventually did finish a couple of books for children in that time and then sort of got the bug to write for adults and it all just evolved from there. But it started out with writing for children. And you were a teacher librarian, is that correct? Yes. Yes, I was. Uh, did my, when I did my teacher training, I chose librarianship as my, you know, you always had to have a second. Um, string to your bow. Yeah, yeah, string to your bow. And so I did and um, was in the classroom for a long time and then in my later years um, was teacher librarian, yeah. Oh, one of us. And a community library um, where I worked. So that meant, you know, from babies to, you know, the oldest person in the district sort of thing. So, yeah, it was good. Oh, that's good. Now, your new book is Birds of a Feather, which is set in a fictional town in your home state. I finished reading it last night and thoroughly enjoyed it. Can you tell our viewers what your story is all about? Well, this story is um, sort of came about because of um, a couple of things. One of them is that I've, I live, uh, where I live is one side of the Spencer Gulf. And I used to live um, prior to that, the other side of the Spencer Gulf on Air Peninsula. So we have these two peninsulas at the bottom of South Australia. And um, both of the places I've lived in were home to the Spencer Gulf prawn fishing fleet. And so I've always, you know, since I've become a writer, I always thought, you know, there's a bit of a story there somewhere to involve this, you know, industry that is quite big in my part of the world. And so that was sort of one thing that was sitting there. And the other thing was um, I was out with my daughter one day and we were having coffee and we were sitting next to another couple who um, we thought was mother and daughter like us. But it turns out that the younger woman, um, her mother had died many years uh, prior, but the woman she was having coffee with was her mother's best friend. 
And I thought, you know, that's a lovely relationship that's different to a lot of the other friendships that we have and they'd maintain that friendship. And so, you know, the different ways we make friends and the friendships we have, that, that sort of mulled along. Um, and then I, I came up with this character of Eve. Eve's a, um, a, a, an old woman. She's just turned 70. Um, she is a businesswoman and she's facing forced retirement. So, you know, I thought, you know, what kind of business will she be in? And then I thought, aha, at last I've got my way of getting the prawn industry into a story. She can be a prawn boat owner. Um, unusual because it's pretty much still a male-dominated field, but um, she originally went into it with her husband. So, you know, I just sort of thought that that would work. Um, and so there's Eve. Um, and then she has an accident early in the story and needs some home help and some nursing care. And she finds Lucy, who's a young woman, not long moved to the town. And she, uh, Lucy is a nurse. And so she comes along to help Eve. And so they're sort of bumbling along together, getting on okay. And then out of the blue, Eve's um, research scientist goddaughter, Julia, turns up from Melbourne comes home and uh, she throws a little bit of a spanner in the works and the three of them, you know, find that they're, they're quite different, um, quite individual, um, determined women who um, are all facing something that has affected them in the past. And it's that that sort of gives them their, I guess, their, their harder side as well as uh, gives them a way of um, forming some friendships. Yeah. Well, you start off the story with a death, and this isn't a spoiler because it happens on page two, which leaves Eve a widow with two small children to raise. And this happens to a lot of women with mixed results, and it, but it's the long-term effect of that event which really sets the basis for the story, doesn't it? Yes, yes. So it's just a little um, prelude, I suppose, to the story to just give you the background of how Eve has got to this point in her life where she's now uh, living on her own and has a business that is, um, you know, starting to get to the point where she's getting too old to manage it. And so, um, yeah, that little bit at the start just gives you the background for that and gets you into the story. What I like about your books is that um, you feature a mature character as your main character in the book, and that's something that isn't really done that much these days and I think because well I'm a mature person it's really nice to read about people like yourself and like myself and the things that can possibly happen to them as they get older. Yes yes I think it, it came in a way from my um, rural romances I mean obviously in those mostly the, the characters were younger um, but they always had interactions with older characters and I liked that interaction of all the different ages and so it kind of moved on naturally when I uh, came up with the idea for Table for Eight which was the first of my more what they call general women's fiction for want of a better name. Um, I pitched it to my publisher and I said it's not really rural romance and it's not historical fiction which I'd also written um, but she said well let's go with it and see see what happens so I wrote that story and uh, it became the first of my general women's fiction and I, I as you say I do like to focus on things that affect um, older women but also you know they're cross-generational so in this story Eve is 70 and you know looking at forced retirement um, Julie is 45 and, and has a sudden job loss and Lucy is in her early 30s and juggling young children and a, and a partner who's a FIFO partner. So, mm. you know, they've all got those different aspects of their lives. Yeah. And look, I like the fact that you wrote a small storyline within the book about COVID, um, which has been a fact of life for all of us for the last two years. How did that affect you as a writer? I suppose you're used to being writing from working from home, but when it's forced upon you and your family, um, how did you cope during that time? I start writing my stories um, for next year at the beginning of the year. So around about February, March, after I've, you know, mulled over and I've got a fair idea of the character, 
does the story, the setting, where I think it should go, then I actually sit down to start writing it. And as I sat down last year to start writing, of course, it was the start of March and we all know where we were in March 2020. So I am sitting there being distracted by all of that um, media coverage and, you know, thinking that what's going to happen, you know, we're all going to get this thing, we all, you know, we're, we're sunk as a human race, it was also doom and gloom. And I found it really hard to uh, be creative in that space. So I uh, eventually sort of, you know, weeks were going by and I'd hardly done anything. And so I, you know, suddenly thought, well, you know, we are, we're still here. Ad admittedly, it's tough, but we're still here. And, you know, at the end of the year, my publisher still wants me to produce a book. So I better jolly well write it. So I, I had to... Um, you know, shut that part away and just get, you know, shut myself away in the office and literally just get down to write. Yeah. But it did, I couldn't help, you know, I write contemporary stories. So I can either choose to ignore it totally and pretend we're all in la-la land and nothing else is happening, or I have to sort of somehow work that into my story. And so I hope I, I did it in a way that the story is not about COVID. It's more about we're faced often with challenges and, you know, things in our lives and it can be anything from a, you know, some sort of medical diagnosis to a death in the family to loss of work, mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's how we face those challenges and how we move on from there is what makes us who we are. So I hope that I've kind of done that with the COVID references. It's not a book about COVID. No, not at all. And I think, you, I think you've done a really good job with that too. In fact, it must be a bit of a challenge as an author with the COVID thing. You either got to set your books in 2019 prior or set them past COVID. But the thing is, we don't know what the future holds. So you'd then be writing a dystopian novel about what we're all like in five, five years' time. So yeah. it must be quite a challenge to make that decision to either put some reference to it in or leave it out altogether. It is. And, I, you know, like while I was writing it, I couldn't resist at one point just slipping in a couple of words that we heard over and over again with the media. And I got to the point where I just thought if I hear them one more time, I'm, you know, like I'm just, I could feel the hackles, you know, my on the back of my neck stand up, but I couldn't resist slipping them into the story. And I don't know if anyone out there in in the, you know, the listeners will um, know what they were, but unprecedented. How many times did we hear that word? Um, and the other one was pivot. So I couldn't resist. I hope that when you read the book, you might just come across them and have a little chuckle and you'll think of me because I just I just had to sneak them in. <laughs> for you. Why not? Gee, if you lived in Victoria, we could sneak in a few words like I can't recall. I don't know how many times we heard that one as well. <laughs> yeah. No, oh, I think that's universal. <laughs> now, Lucy's partner um, is a fly-in, fly-out worker, as you mentioned, and you did a really good job of showing what effect that has for mothers of children left to get on with life without having a partner to help them out. Um, did you speak to a lot of fly in, fly out people, you know, to do some research on that part of the book? I did. Um, I did. I, I drew first on my own um, experience. I, my husband wasn't a FIFO worker, but he was a week away at a time worker. <laughs> So when our children were young, um, he would be gone all week. And um, that, you know, even though it's short term, obviously there are some things that you think, oh, gosh, you know, that I could relate to it. And oh, so was, yeah, <laughs> I'm seeing a nice little comment there. Somebody else is in the same boat. So um, I had that, I guess, always as a reference because I still remember those times very well. But obviously... Times have moved on. We have mobile phone. I didn't have a mobile phone back then and, and things like that. So, yes, I did speak to some young friends, one young couple who they're, they're no longer in that uh, job situation but, you know, were and had little ones at the time and then, you know, another another family that uh, are still living that life. So 
that was really helpful to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just to yeah, flesh it out. The fact that you wrote about other health issues that face people on a day to day basis, and how you can go from being quite capable to all of a sudden being dependent on others overnight when that's not the way you rock. Um, Eve was always in control of things until she had that accident and she lost her ability to do the most basic things. And that was when Lucy came to help her. And that's not a spoiler because that happens anyway. Yeah. Um, I think we all take life for granted. You know, when things like that happen, you know, that we're all walking and talking and how your world can just change overnight. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yes. And look, in doing my research on you, Tricia, I've discovered that you wrote a couple of other books called Due Date and Changing Channels, which were both rural romances. Were those your first venture into novel writing? Um, due Date, Changing Channels and River Magic. So there were three. Okay. Um, and so after I wrote the children's books, um, I started writing for adults, sent them off to publishers, had no luck. So I self-published. So those three books were my self-published books. Oh. Um, and then I discovered by the time I was writing book four, um, when I wrote the first one, um, there was no uh, rural romance genre as such. There were some people writing in it, like Rachel Treasure, but um, no one called it that. Like it didn't actually have a name. So by the time I was writing book four, I was reading more and more and, and there were more people writing it. And I suddenly realised, I know where my book fits. It's rural romance. So um, that gave me a handle then to pitch it to a publisher and I was able to do that. So that uh, my fourth book that I for adults was my first book with Harlequin, Queen of the Road. But then as time went on and um, the other rural romances were doing really well, they asked me to get those self-published books out because they'd had a very small audience, you know, just in my, you know, South Australia. Some Lots of South Australian libraries stopped them, which was wonderful, and a few in Western Australia. Um, but they hadn't had a lot of, you know, broad readership. So we rebadged them, gave them a fresh edit, you know, had to make a few changes, obviously, and so they became uh, some of my Harlequin books as well. Well, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Now, you've written, also written a three-book Australian historical fiction series featuring a family spanning multiple generations. Then you switch to standalone rural fiction and now contemporary women's fiction. What brought about the change in your writing? Uh, well, as I said, I got, I got into the rural romance because I wanted to write stories about country South Australia and um, that just seemed to naturally follow. Um, but for many years prior to that, I've um, loved visiting the Flinders Ranges, which is in the north of South Australia, magnificent mountain country up there. And we go there a couple of times a year. And it just, I, all I can say is it kind of spoke to me somehow. Um, so I've been collecting notes for years about what it was like to live there, the weather, the, you know, the landscape kind of painting a picture, I suppose, but with words. And then, you know, more and more a story started to evolve. So I just felt that I really wanted to write this historical. Um, and, yeah, my publisher once again said, go for it. So that's... Yeah, you don't see many books that, or authors that write in a series much anymore. And I really like reading books in a series. Do you think, mm. apart from like Robin... Publishers Hart, don't like them. <laughs> only because uh, they they worry that people pick up you know grab up a book and think oh this looks really good oh but it's book two or it's book three oh I haven't read book one and they put it back down again um but and I guess to a point that that is that's true but um if you enjoy a series you know there's nothing like knowing yay there's another one coming mm. um but also um I what I tried to do was to wrap each one up in its own story so if someone did pick up one two or three they're not numbered so yeah. it doesn't matter you know you can pick up any one they're the same uh, family but next generation of the family in each story and a couple of the characters live long enough to stretch through the whole thing but you know each one is introduced as a fresh story and so 
um, you don't have to have prior knowledge to have, to have read, you know, book two or three. Yeah, but it is tricky. Yeah, publishers aren't keen on them so much as a series. No. But then there's some, you know, you look at Robin Carr's Virgin River series, 21 books in the series, and, you know, yeah. she wrote a new one, I think it was last year or the year before, something like that. So, yeah. you know, readers, I think sometimes publishers don't talk to the readers. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> now, um, a few years ago, as you said, there were a lot of Australian authors writing rural romance. But that trend, if you could call it that, seems to have diminished a little bit and there's not quite as many people out there writing it. And a lot of them have switched to um, contemporary women's fiction. Um, why do you think that's happened? Is that just... Um, because all of a sudden there was too many rural romances out there and everyone swung to a different genre? I don't think so. I think there is still a lot of rural romance. It's, yes. it's still one of the biggest sellers. Um, but I guess some, some writers like me have evolved and, you know, want to take the story in another direction. Um, my, my stories, you know, what I'm trying to get across, I think, in my stories is the essence of living in Australia and how life is for us. And I can do that in different ways, you know, through the rural romance and now in the genre that I'm writing. And I know, yeah, some of my writing buddies are also doing that. But um, for every one of them, there's a fresh new voice mm. coming. So, Yeah. They're like mushrooms, you know, every year there's all these new authors just appear on the scene. You think, oh, my goodness, you know, as some change genres, there's always someone to replace them, which is yes. good. It's good. Yeah, yes, because I think rural romance readers are avid readers. They, you know, devour books very quickly, so we can't keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> now, as we always have a few aspiring writers that always attend these events, what would be a piece of advice that you would give them? Ah, oh, it's persist. You know, you it's I know for me, I just kept thinking, oh, you know, I'm never, I'm never gonna finish this book. And that was, you know, advice given to me by other writers, you know, to to just keep uh, keep going, to keep writing, to do it regularly as often as you can, you know. And I had teenage children when I was writing, I had full-time work you know I had every excuse under the sun not to write but the best bit of advice was you know if you want to finish that book you keep writing even if it's only a few words a day and you'll eventually finish so that's that's kind of one thing um, and it's practice even if you're not a writer who wants to write a book it's about honing your craft and you might be writing short stories or short pieces but you should write them regularly to keep that practice up and the other thing that I would say is to join a writing group of some form and you know for me I lived in a place where I wasn't able to access a face-to-face -face writing group I worked full-time and the local group met during the day so I um, joined SA Writers and I also joined um, I some of the writing courses that I had done ended up having online chat groups you know so we kept in touch with each other so I did that as well and I think that that is really important to be in tune with other writers um, whether they're really experienced writers or just starting out writers wherever you are in between um, it, you know that all helps it doesn't matter if you're the newest person on the writing block or, or you've been there with lots of books behind you we, we, we still all can share and, and learn from each other so and I think the Australian writing community, from what I can gather, are very, very supportive of each other too. Definitely, definitely. I've got so many great writing friends. I belong to um, RWA, Romance Writers of Australia, and that is a fantastic organisation. If you're looking to join something, I should have mentioned that as well. Um, they run some fabulous um, classes and a lot of online things. They have a lot of mentorships um, and... It's not just about romance writing. You know, I know crime writers that belong to romance writers. It's 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 it certainly has a romance focus, but it's also about the craft of writing. So, you know, if you need to learn the craft of writing, it's a good place to start. Yeah. And do you have another work in progress at the moment for next year? Uh, it's already off with my publisher. Um, so <laughs> I'd like to get it finished before I get into the launch of, of the new book. 
um, so that it's gone. <laughs> um, and so, yes, it's, uh, it, I don't have a title for it at the moment. I, it had a working title, but I wasn't really happy with it. So we're still talking about that. But I'd like to, um, it's, it's just a, a little bit about, a, um, has a, a bit of background of a, a group of women who attend a fitness class. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to that one when it comes out. That's for sure. That's something we all need. We're all carrying COVID kilos at the moment. So that would was that your inspiration for this one? <laughs> well, I've been lucky in South Australia. Um, I mean, we we did we were kept out of classes for a while, but you know we've come and gone a few times, and you know now we're back allowed to go to to our group sessions again. So. Um, yeah, I haven't missed out. If I've missed out, it's my own fault, not not because the classes weren't there. <laughs> and what sort of books do you like reading, Trisha? And have you got some recommendations for us or something you're reading at the moment? Oh, I love, I, I read all sorts. Um, and uh, I've got a, I've just finished Crocodile Tears by Alan Carter. So he's a crime writer, an Australian crime writer, and I love his work because it is so basically Australian. You know, it's um, really good, often set in Western Australia, which is um, obviously where he's based. Um, Kato Kwong is the detective and he brings him back in, in each book and, and, and he changes with each book. So it's, yeah, I really enjoy that. Um, I'm currently reading The Unusual Abduction of Avery Conifer, and I'm really sorry, I just cannot think of the author's name. It's a really long title, um, but it's such a great story. You know, this um, little girl is um, taken by her two grandmothers who think that she needs to be kept safe. And I won't say any more than that, but it's it's a huge dilemma and it's really, really interesting. But there are moments when I've actually laughed out loud Oh, thank you. Lisa Evans. Thanks, Courtney. <laughs> uh, Lisa Evans is the author. Sorry, Lisa, and forgetting her name. So, yeah, that's a great read. Really enjoyed that. Mm. That's good. Now, if readers want to connect with you, what's the best way for them to catch up with you? Oh, so I try and do all sorts. I have an Instagram page and a Facebook page um, and a website where uh, people can email me from there. And I also, um, once, uh, four times a year, I should say, I send out a newsletter. So that's, um, you know, I try and, and have a bit of stuff in there that um, I keep just for newsletter readers or they might hear it first before anyone else does. So that's every, at the start of every season, I send that out. And you can um, sign up for that if you'd like to. Um, there's a spot on my website or at the top of my Facebook page, there's a join button there so just try and keep active in all of those spaces so that um, you know try and answer people's uh, messages as quickly as I can and keep in touch yeah love to hear from people Trisha's books are all available available to borrow from the library in all formats and the ebook and the audiobook versions are also available through BorrowBox and Libby now do we have any questions from the audience who would like to ask Trisha a question happy to answer them. There was one in the chat earlier, Janine, so I've sent that to you. Okay. If you want to ask that while people put their hands up? Yep, I can see it. Okay, so Elizabeth has asked, do you create special atmosphere for yourself when you write and what makes your writing going? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, going, maybe. I, um, I, I'm presuming that you mean when I, so I, when I'm writing that first draft, I'm very focused and I spend um, a fair bit of every day writing and um, I'm in my office and I write in silence pretty much. I don't play music or, you know, have any distractions. I like to um, be quiet. <laughs> um, when, when I'm editing and doing other things like that, I, you know, sometimes play music or do other things, move around, you know, like I can take my laptop and, go and have a coffee somewhere sometimes just for a change of scenery. But mostly when I'm doing that creative first draft, I am very focused and, yeah, just funnel, tunnel visioned. 
And she's also asked too, what main message do you want your readers to take from Birds of a Feather? Well, I, you know, I get asked this question a lot. I should know the answer. I really, um, I, I basically, I really just want people to enjoy the read, you know, without having to um, be bogged down by too much. But I, I always think, you know, I hope people will sort of experience walking in someone else's shoes for a little while and just think, oh, you know, that could have been me or, wow, I had never thought of it like that or, um, and also that they might learn something new. You know, there's um, something in the story that they perhaps haven't come across before. So there's, there's those sorts of things. But basically I just, I really want readers to finish the book and feel like they've enjoyed being with those characters, um, that they've, they're left with a sense of um, hope for the future because I, I like that sort of happy for now feeling at the end of a book. I try and wrap everything up so that, you know, it's, it's just I, it's the sort of book I like to read. I don't like to end in doom and gloom. So I, I like to have um, that sort of a happy enough ending. Mm. Uh, Amy is asking, when you do an audio book, do you get a say in who the narrator is? Yes, thanks, Amy, I do. Um, I am really, really pleased with the work of Casey Withus, who is um, the narrator of several of my books now. I just think she's such a talent um, and she's only a young woman herself, but her range of uh, voices is fantastic. The first thing I do uh, when my when my book is available is I buy myself a copy of the audio book um, for the car, and I because I do a lot of driving around, obviously for events. Um, so I listen to it, and um, oh wow, I, it's I had goosebumps when she started. I just thought, wow, she's she does such a great job, and um, you know, from the case of Poppy, who's a little girl. And then, you know, to, to Eve, who's 70, you know, she has this wonderful range. And even the male voices, she just comes across and you really think it's, a, you know, the way that she does it. It's just very, she's very talented. Yeah, there must be a real skill to doing that too. Definitely. People have asked me, you know, whether I would do it. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I, you know, I quite like to read, but I, you know, it's a huge job. They spend a lot of time in studio getting it right, so it's a big job. Mm. Yeah. Now, Michelle has asked, are there any book club discussion questions available for Birds of a Feather? Yes. Yes, they're in inside the back cover. Michelle, was that? Sorry. Yes. Uh, oh, if I can find them. I think we ended up with, um, oh, they're not numbered, but anyway, there's a couple, there's a couple of pages of them there at the back. Yeah. Very last pages. Can't even open it. <laughs> do, you, do you actually say that all your books are available on on audiobook? Um, no, sorry. Who am I talking to? It's Ruth. Hi, Ruth. Oh, hi, how are you? Uh, good, thank you. Um, no, they're not all on audio, Ruth. I think it's the last um, five. Yeah, because I was I was looking six. for one and I couldn't find it. That oh. I couldn't borrow it find it on Borobot, so yeah. My historicals aren't, and my first perhaps three or four. Oh, okay. Mm. Yeah, Down in the Vines or what's it called, Down in the Vines? Uh, uh, between the Vines? Yes, that's it. That's it. Yep. No, no. It's not. Okay. That explains why I couldn't find it on Borobot. <laughs> but everyone after that. <laughs> okay, fine. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Linda's asked, what, give, what gives you the most pleasure with your writing? Oh, that's a lovely question, Linda. Thank you. Um, I just love doing it. <laughs> I love it's a creativity that I really enjoy. I love spending time with those characters. Um, some days I'm ready, like any group of people, some days I'm ready to throttle them. <laughs> And other days I think, oh, you know, let's, let's go have coffee together. It's such good fun. Um, so I think it's the actual process that I really enjoy. And then, um, and then doing events or, or coming out to meet people and, you know, even if we are online, it's still really nice to uh, meet people, to talk about the book and to hear what people like and, you know, all those sorts of things. So I do enjoy that because I do spend so much time alone just with the characters in my head. It's nice to nice to see real people. 
Um, she's also asked, um, do you people watch to get inspiration for your characters? Most definitely. <laughs> Um, I always have a notebook in my bag and um, I know my family have often accused me of eavesdropping on the dinner table next door to us when we're, I mean, other people's stories are far more interesting than what's happening at our table. So um, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, obviously I'm not uh, mimicking any one person, but sometimes um, there's just a, a little a word or a way someone walks or a way they um, wear their glasses or, you know, all sorts of little things that you see in the world around you and you think, oh, you know, that little aspect might work its way into a character. But I certainly people watch, but I don't copy. That wouldn't be good. <laughs> wouldn't be right. No, no. no. Um, now, out of all the books you've written, do you have a favourite book or character? Is that like asking who your favourite child is? It is. So do you know what I always say? The one that's closest to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think um, it's also because it's freshest and I haven't quite let these characters go yet, so they're still in my heart and in my head. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's this one always, the one that I'm just talking to you about now, I think, oh, yeah. That's good. Now, as a bonus, we do have a giveaway of a copy of Trisha's book for one lucky viewer. And all you need to do is just answer a very simple question. And the question is, what state of Australia is birds of a feather set in? All you need to do is send an email to, oh. and Courtney will put it in the chat, um, and it is I-A-N-W-A-B, which is the letters for In a Nook with a Book, at cclc.pic.gov.au with your answer. Courtney will put it in the chat there so that you can see what it is. And... Um, We'll close this competition on Monday next week, the 25th of October at midnight, and we'll draw a winner and let you know by email if you've been lucky enough. Also, if you want to purchase a copy of Birds of the Feather from Robinson's Books over at Fountain Gate, Tricia has made a very special offer. Tell them about it, Tricia. I have. So I have um, book plates, and I'm very happy if you want to email me your... Um, name and address where you'd like who you'd like the book plate made out to and they fit in um fit in the front of the book just there very nicely so i'd be more than happy to post one out to you and um my uh, my email address is very simple it's trisha at trishastringer.com and if um, if you don't have time to jot that down if you just go to my website there's um just a general form there that always gets to me so if you can fill that out and let me know and I would very happily send you a book plate um, signed for you to put in the front of your book. And wouldn't that make a fantastic Christmas present too so do your Christmas shopping get one for mum one for grandma one for nana <laughs> one for your sister one for your auntie buy heaps and you can get them all personalised. What a terrific service. Thank you, Tricia. My pleasure. Sorry I couldn't be there to do it in person. <laughs> yes, well, you would have been. Yeah. But anyway, and also I just want to let everyone know that if you haven't already joined, join our Facebook group, which is In a Knock with a Book, and you can share what you've been reading with everyone. There's quite a lot of Aussie authors that are in there as well, so um, you'd be able to chat to them. Yeah. And we also have a monthly podcast called Book Matters. And we chat to Australian and international authors on there. So subscribe by your usual podcast providers or you can just go onto our library website and just do a search for Book Matters and all the other episodes will all be there for you to have a listen to as well. Now, next month, we're hosting two more lovely Australian authors. We've got Heather Morris and we've also got Fiona McIntosh as well coming on to chat. So details are on our website, so make sure you book in for those. And there will also be giveaways of each of those books as well. And with Fiona, there's also the chance to win a Hermes scarf, which is valued at just under $200. So it's worthwhile coming along. Well, if there are no other answers, oh, hang on. Yes, there is another answer. Um, 
Natalie wants to know, answer question. Natalie <laughs> wants to know who designs your covers for your books? Oh, uh, the last two have been done by a lovely um, young lady called Deborah Bilson. And she works obviously for HarperCollins and she and a team of people do it. So um, this one in particular um, has had a lot of work done on it. And um, it's meant to be, Eve lives out of town a little way in an old farmhouse. So it's kind of meant to represent her um, house. And when I don't get, you know, like when I get to see the cover, it almost looks like this. It's almost finished. They don't, um, they don't give me too much say, <laughs> but I always love them. But um, I did think that uh, through the, through the, Eve's not a gardener. And in the original picture, this was a really neat, tidy little garden and it had a white picket fence. And I said, you know, no, Eve wouldn't have that. So they very kindly changed that bit for me. So that was what I had a say in. <laughs> but if you read, if you get a copy of the book and you read down here, these are all the different elements that have gone into this title and they're all accredited to different um, people. So it's quite interesting, the story of a cover. And uh, what else have we got? Oh, Susan would like to thank you for your great books and your newsletter. And oh, Linda a says, newsletter reader. You are just as lovely as your books. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> and, oh, hang on. There is another question. Camilla is asking, do you find that you need to take a break in between writing books? Do you often have new ideas or characters that are waiting for you to revisit as soon as you wrap up writing each book? When I send that book to my publisher, I'm a bit, I, I feel like I'm almost brain dead at that point, you know, like I just cannot take in another thing and I, I just need to walk away from that and have a break I do that and then it's time to release the new book so now I'm immersing myself back in that and so I'm actually I'm feeling really lazy so during the day today I I did all sorts of other things I guess it's kind of like being um you know when you're in a day-to-day -day job and you have a holiday you know you clean out cupboards and you you know go and catch up on coffee with a friend if you're allowed <laughs> um, or you know all those sort of things that you don't always get time to do in your day job so um, I feel a little bit rudderless at, at the minute but in the background is next year's story already you know just twinkling away there I'll just think door a little bit sorry it's like a revolving door a little bit as yeah. one goes out and other ones coming in <laughs> <laughs> there was also another question that wasn't mine but with your, your audio books do you get to choose who the reader is oh that one yeah i talked about that yes i do oh, get a say yes. no that's okay i do i do get a say yes yeah and we've got another one here from vicky um asking is it hard to talk about a published book when you have a new one with the publisher and probably another one whirling around in your head um, I do have to reacquaint myself because um, the last time I saw Birds of a Feather was early this year when I, you know, did when the last proofread was done. So, um, and then of course I was writing something else in between. So when, when it um, comes out in book form, I have to go, oh, I have to revisit the book, but it soon all comes back and yeah, I, yeah, spend time. Amy is also asking, in the process of writing, how much of the editing do you do or is this outsourced? Uh, well, when I send it in to my publisher for the first time, obviously I want it to be the best that it can be. Um, I don't want her to send it back and say, oh, Lord, I like this. Um, so I've spent a lot of time on it. Um, she reads it. Um, she may make some recommendations, but then it goes to the editor who looks who reads it for herself looks at what the publisher has said and then comes back to me and it, it's more about have I missed anything have I have I not finished off rounded off a character properly have I left something unsaid that needed to be said you know like those sorts of structural things so we spend a bit of time on that and then it gradually gets to the point where we're just honing sentences making them clearer um, and uh, then it gets down to grammar and punctuation and all of those sorts of things. So there's quite a few processes, 
but I love it. I love the editing process. It's it's so good to finally be able to spend some time talking with someone else about my book. <laughs> okay, well, I think that's a wrap. I don't think we've got any more questions in the chat there. I have one more thing, you have, if I may. Yes, certainly. Please. I brought, it's a little bit battered because these they don't travel very well, but in the story there are, um, this South Aussie icon, it's a frog cape. Of course. And this poor fellow, his mouth has been squished shut. Normally their mouth is a little bit open. And you can see he's got two little tiny, oh, two little tiny dots there for eyes. Um, these are hand cut at the end of the process. So they're a, they're a, um, a square of sponge with some jam in the middle um, a lovely lot of creamy uh, filling at the, in the dome at the top, and then this is a fondant icing. And after it's put on, they're hand cut for the mouth and the eyes are added. And they're, they're, um, if you haven't ever had one, I hope that one day you get to South Australia and you have one. They don't send them interstate because they. you can see this one, I've had him for a few days, and they do get a bit squishy. But, um, yes, yeah, so they're in the story. So if you're wondering what a frog cake is, there you are, you've seen one. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Tricia, for coming on and chatting tonight. And let's hope that next time we can actually have you in the library in person. Fingers crossed. Yes. All the best with Birds of a Feather. I really recommend everyone go out and buy a copy because all of Tricia's books are usually very good books. And the last three have all become top titles at our library service, which means thank we you. have it separate collection that we buy for each branch so that people can come in and they don't have to wait three months to pick up a oh. copy of the book they've had on hold. We put the most popular books all go get bought under top titles and there's no, you can't put them on hold. You only get them for two weeks. So there's a good chance that you'll be able to pick up a current copy of something when you walk into the branch. And as I said, the last three of your books, and this one will probably be the same, will be top titles. Oh, thank you. Thank you to everybody at Casey Cardinia Libraries. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. And as I said, don't forget, we've got a couple more events coming up next month. So please book in for those and get a chance to win a book and get your entries in to win a copy of Trisha's book as well. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.